Well, hey, everybody. Um, if you're watching this video uh, of our Galatians Bible study, it's because uh, Leah's had a baby. Uh, we, uh, we were looking at uh, Leah probably having the baby today, which it's, it's Tuesday today, and, and uh, I, we just wanted to go ahead and get this recorded uh, so that we didn't have to skip this Thursday um, if the baby does come. So I appreciate your prayers, and we're really excited. Uh, so tonight, um, we're going to be covering Galatians chapter 5. And before we get into that, though, I just want to show you one of the things I've been trying to do when we meet is, is share a few different Bible reading tools that I think are really good. Um, uh, and the one I want to show you today, actually, I want to show you two. One is the Keyword Study Bible. So this is from AMG Publishers. This is an ESV, the English Standard Version. Uh, but it's a keyword study Bible. So what a keyword study Bible is, is, is when, you're, when you're reading the text, it'll have words, various words underlined in the text. And it'll have a number next to that word. And then you go to the back of the Bible uh, where they have uh, a dictionary, and you look up that number, and it tells you what the Hebrew, if you're in the Old Testament, or Greek, if you're in the New Testament, uh, word is and what the meaning of it is and the origin of it is. So you can actually do a word study. It's hugely beneficial. Uh, and so if you're fascinated by that and you want to know the meaning of words and, and what this English word is translated from uh, and get a little bit more into the Greek without having to study Greek, uh, I highly recommend a key, a key word study Bible. The other one I wanted to mention is one that I said I'd try to remember to bring this week, uh, last week, and I remembered. Uh, so this is a parallel Bible. And so this has four different translations of, of Scripture uh, in it. NIV, KJV, uh, NIV is the New International Version, KJV, the King James Version, NASB, the New American Standard Version, and the Amplified Version, AMP. And so when you open it, it literally has four columns, uh, and they're all the same chapter, same verses, but in the different translations. So you can very quickly compare those. Another great tool is BibleGateway.com. You can look up any verse in any translation very easily. That's BibleGateway.com. So uh, I highly recommend those when you're, when you're st some, some kind of tool when you're studying uh, the Scripture. Uh, so before I read the text like we do every night, I want to pray. And, and then uh, I'm going to do a little bit of, of introduction and recap. And then we're going to read Galatians chapter 5 all at once. Again, I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version, but I think it's very beneficial to follow along with other translations if you can. Um, and, uh, and then we'll get moving. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for uh, this way that we could still study it together no matter what's going on around us. Um, Lord, what wonderful tools uh, you've blessed us with uh, in the way of of cameras and, um, and the internet, Lord. And uh, I just pray that you continue to teach us how to use these things effectively. Lord, as, as we get ready to dive into Galatians chapter 5, Lord, I pray you prepare our hearts and minds. Um, Lord, each of us are on a different part of our journey, and we have different things we need to learn. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would get us in the right frame of mind for that, um, for what you have for each of us uh, tonight. We'll forever pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, we're in Galatians chapter 5. A uh, quick recap just of the whole letter. You know, Paul is writing to the Galatians. You remember one of the things we read a lot about here in Galatians, particularly in chapter 2, but also in Acts and other parts of the New Testament, is that Paul felt very called by God to preach the gospel to Gentiles, meaning people who were not Jewish. And, and so in Galatians, he's writing a letter to Galatian Gentile Christians who, since he has left and went on to plant another church somewhere else, uh, uh, have been led astray from the gospel by a, a group that, that we often call in Scripture the Judaizers. These are people who are Jewish Christians who come along after Paul and say, yes, you need Jesus to be saved, but you also need to be circumcised. You also need to follow these, uh, these Jewish ritualistic laws, Mosaic laws uh, that you find in Leviticus chapter 23 and other places. And and so the, the central, centrality of the argument is you still have to be circumcised to be saved. It's not Jesus isn't enough. You still have to be circumcised, and you have to obey all the rest of the law. And so this whole letter is Paul saying to the Gentiles, uh, you know, that's a different gospel than what I preached to you. You only need Jesus. Jesus has fulfilled the law, uh, and, and he is the only one who can save us. You're saved by faith 
you know, through grace, uh, or by, saved by grace through faith, uh, and not by works. And, and so he's kind of a continuing this argument uh, in Galatians chapter 5. And, and one of the things that I'm going to be doing uh, throughout our conversation, you know, normally what we do is after we read through it once, we read through it and then we ask a question and have a little discussion. We read through some more text, ask a question. Well, obviously we can't have discussion right now. So what I'm going to do is whenever I do have a question, um, I'm going to put it up on the screen. And I want to encourage you to pause the video. And, and if you're with someone, discuss the question. If you're not, just consider the question. Maybe write down how you would answer it uh, before I kind of give my thoughts on that question and move forward. All right, so Galatians chapter 5. In Galatians chapter 4, Paul has talked about being free in Christ and what that means. See, that's how he concludes chapter 4, giving the example, uh, uh, the metaphorical example of Hagar and Sarah and their respective children. You can go back and read that if you want to get a, a quick recap. But now we pick up in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision... That's as, as if, if you accept circumcision as a way of salvation. If you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. Verse 3, I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision, circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Verse 4, you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we are ourselves eagerly, awa eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Verse 6, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Verse 7, You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view and that no one who is troubling you will bear the, I'm sorry, and that the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I bother, but if, but if I brothers still preach circumcision, why am I being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. Verse 12, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Paul's getting pretty upset here. Verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 15. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Verse 16, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, Verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. All right, so let's jump back to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Now remember, as we said earlier, he's just come off of this, this kind of illustration, this allegory he presents to us. He talks about how... Uh, you know, Abraham, God promised Abraham that he would have an heir, but Abraham was getting old and Sarah was barren. And so they didn't see how God could keep that promise. So they thought, well, maybe we need to help God keep that promise. This is from the Old Testament. It's from Genesis, right? And so Sarah has her servant girl, Hagar, uh, sleep with Abraham. And then Abraham gets Hagar pregnant and Hagar bears a son named Ishmael. 
And, and that's a son born of a slave, born by, uh, by man's designs. Later on, Sarah miraculously does become pregnant with Abraham's son, Isaac. And so, uh, so Paul uses this story that, that his audience would know as an illustration. He says, you know, Hagar's son was a son of slavery uh, brought about by the, the schemes of man. But Isaac was the son of promise. He was free, not a slave, because he's the result of the promise. We are to be like that. We are to trust in God's promises, not try to devise our own ways to save ourselves. He, and he says, Paul is saying, that's what leads to freedom. And so in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, he continues this thought with a powerful, very well-known statement from Scripture. Paul says, for freedom Christ has set us free. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. So here's the first question I have for you. For freedom Christ has set us free. What does this mean? What does that statement mean? Some of your translations will say something like, uh, for freedom's sake, Christ has set you free. What is it that Paul is trying to say here? I want to encourage you to pause the video. Think about that for a minute. What, what does it mean that for freedom, Christ has set us free? Well, let's review for a moment. Let's review uh, some of the things we've already learned. In both chapter 2 and chapter 3, Paul refers to the law as a guardian, right, or a manager that was there to manage us when we were slaves before we were set free, okay? And, and so the law was, was designed to control us as kind of this outward arbitrary way to keep us submitted to Christ, or to God, I should say, and then... <clears throat> and then when we're set free in Christ, the law is no longer this outward thing, right? But this inward thing. And so it makes us think of, of, of uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. This is a great verse uh, that I have here in my notes. It says, again, this is the ESV, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. So here's something that's going to happen after those days, in the future. I will put my law where? Within them. I will write it on their what? On their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. All right? Uh, so uh, this guardian, this law uh, that, that is your slave owner, one day will be removed. And one day the law will be written on our hearts. Now, what is he talking about here? Well, what the Bible teaches us is that when Jeremiah prophesied this, he's talking about when the Holy Spirit will come and live within us. So now the law is not this arbitrary set of rules I have to follow, but, but the Holy Spirit himself, God himself, comes and lives within me and helps me to actually desire what God desires. This Sunday we're going to be talking about, uh, well, not this Sunday, but in one of the coming Sundays soon, we're going to be talking about the day of Pentecost in Acts. You know, Pentecost was a, a Jewish festival day, and, and it means the 50th. You know, it was literally the, the 50th day after the last festival. Some say it's after the Passover. Others say it's 50 days after the, the festival of the first fruits. But the point is this. Pentecost was the Jewish way of celebrating when Moses received the law on Mount Sinai. Okay? Uh, many of them believe that that happened 50 days after the Exodus. And so, so at Pentecost, Jewish people would come from all over. It was right around the beginning of June, so traveling uh, conditions were good, and any Jewish person who lived within Jerusalem that, or, or within uh, proximity to Jerusalem that could, that could travel to Jerusalem was required by Jewish law to travel there and celebrate Pentecost and celebrate the giving of the law, the Mosaic law on Mount Sinai. Well, on Pentecost, the day that they celebrate the law, that's also the day in Acts chapter 2 that God decides to send his Holy Spirit. Remember, we've talked several times in this class about how in John chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus says, hey, when I go away, when I ascend into heaven, it's going to be good for you because then the Holy Spirit will come. God himself will come and live within you. You know, gone are the days where the Holy Spirit would just fall upon one or two people for a little bit of time. And now here, here is a time where God himself, the Holy Spirit, can come and dwell in you forever, can dwell in you for all of eternity. And so some people suggest that maybe God chose Pentecost, the day that Jews, the Jewish people celebrated getting the law, as the day the Holy Spirit would come, to show the replacement, 
to show how the law would not no longer be this outward arbitrary thing, but would become this thing that was written on their hearts. Uh, another great tool, uh, Rosie, if you're watching, this is your moody commentary. She, Rosie, let me borrow this so I could, so I could check it out. Uh, Rose, I'm sorry, I'm calling you Rosie. I hope you don't mind. Anyway, I'm going to quote this commentary. It has a really good point about this. The commentary says this, It is possible that God gave the Holy Spirit on Pentecost to contrast with the law. The law was an external means of restraining Israel from sin. But in the new era of the church, the Holy Spirit would provide, listen, internal power for believers to live righteously. Do you see the difference? So, when Paul says it's for freedom that Christ has set us free, he's talking about freeing us from the law. When, when Paul says it's for freedom that Christ sets us free, what he means is, is that Christ wants you to be free from the law. That's why he has set you free. And, and do I need to, to cover all the verses in the Bible that talk about how important it is to God that you are free? All the way back in Psalms 118, verse 5. It says, in my anguish I cried to the Lord, and he answered by setting me free. Psalms 146, verse 7 and 8. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. For this reason, Christ, the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom, has set them to set them free. He died on the cross as a ransom to set them free. How about John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32? You know this. You will know the truth, Jesus says, and the truth will set you free. How about John 8, 36, where Jesus says, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And then Paul adds to this. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. There's this really kind of tragic, uh, true story that historian Shelby Foote records in his three-volume history of the Civil War. I've shared this from the pulpit before. Uh, but he talks about after, how after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed by Abraham Lincoln, you know, freeing all slaves, that a lot of slaves went on living as if they were slaves. Even though they were legally free, even though they had every right to go on and live in freedom, they continued to live as slaves. Why? Because they didn't know how else to live. They didn't understand what it meant to be free. The idea of freedom sounded good, but they remained in that uh, in that. Uh, sort of, of, of lostness in that slavery. And how many Christians have the same problem? Christ has set us free from the law, set us free from fear of shame and guilt, given us a freedom, right, to live in triumph and victory. And yet so many Christians are bogged down with shame and guilt as if Jesus has not forgiven them, as if Jesus did not take their sins and put them to death, take them as far as the east is from the west on the cross. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And so then Paul says in the rest of that verse, stand firm therefore and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Next question, how do you stand firm against the yoke of slavery? Remember, the law, the guardian, that, that now the devil wants to try to get you to, to submit back to that guardian of the law instead of submitting to Christ. How do you stand firm against that? Because it is so easy to fall in, fall back in uh, to, to, uh, to the old way of submitting to the law. So what do you think that means? Take a moment and consider that question. I have a few ideas. One of the things that I want to say is, is very, very clearly, and hopefully you've seen this sort of of tension uh, and seeing this sort of, of uh, competition uh, throughout uh, our study so far, uh, the law is not your savior. Jesus is. I believe last week we talked a little bit about how, um, you know, the devil is always trying to distract you from Christ. I, I just had an email conversation with a, a young lady this week who, who is dealing with... Um, someone in their life who's telling them that, that they can't go to heaven because they're not in the right denomination and they're not reading from the right version of the Bible. And, and I just think that's a great example of how the devil wants you to think that your salvation depends on the translation of the Bible you use or on, uh, on the denominational title you have instead of your relationship with Christ. And the same is true of the law. The devil wants you to get you focused and relying on anything but Jesus. So uh, if he can get you to believe that the law is your savior, that obeying the law will save you, 
then you won't depend on Christ. And so how do we stand firm against the yoke of slavery? Remember that Jesus is your Savior. In the words of, of Jerry Bridges, preach the gospel to yourself every single day. Preach the gospel to yourself every single day. Don't just recite words. Think about their meaning, right? For God so loved the world, right? God loved me so much that he gave his only son. What does it mean? What is it like to give your only son? That he gave his only son that whoever believes in Jesus. So all I have to do is believe in Jesus, right? I will not perish. What am I being saved from there? but have everlasting life. Preach the gospel to yourself every day. That's one way to stand firm against the yoke of slavery. Another way is accountability. If you struggle with this, find some people in your life uh, that you trust, that have have, uh, a love for Christ, and ask them to, to help you with this, to hold you accountable to this. Maybe to send you verses once or twice a week that reminds you of the gospel. Maybe to ask you once or twice a week, hey, are you trusting Jesus today or are you trusting something else for your salvation? And finally, you know, one of the things that I think that we miss a lot in Christianity is the importance of making choices. You know, we, we covered this last Sunday, this idea that God has given us free will. And I believe that the gift of free will that God has given us is one of the primary ways, if not the primary way, we're made in the image of God. You know, a lot of times we read in, in Genesis that God made us in his image, uh, and we think that somehow we have a physical resemblance to God. But the Bible also says that God is invisible because he's spirit, right? Uh, and I wish I could tell you the reference so you could look that up. But if you Google it, you know, God is invisible. Uh, what's the Bible verse that says God is invisible? You can find it. Um, but the point is, it's not the physical resemblance, right? Because we are, we are physical and spiritual, but God is spiritual. How do we resemble God? How are we made in his image? Well, we have the ability to choose things. And so I want to say to you that one of the ways that you stand firm against the yoke of slavery, of believing that the law must save you, that you must obey the law to be saved, is you need to choose to trust Jesus instead of the law. Choose to trust Jesus instead of yourself. Say it out loud when you're starting to be overwhelmed with fear. I choose right now to trust Jesus. I choose to trust him in what he has said. I choose to trust Jesus. Uh, uh, what he has done. I choose to trust the cross. I choose to trust the resurrection. I choose to choose to trust Jesus. Let's look at verse two. It's amazing. We're only at verse two. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Verse two, look. What is, why does Paul say look? Because he's upset. Have you ever said that? Somebody look, you know, listen to me. Look, Paul says, I, Paul, say to you, all right, here's how serious I am. That if you accept circumcision, so if you accept circumcision, that's the way ESV words it, as a, as a way of salvation. If you accept circumcision as something you have to do in order to be saved, Christ will be of no advantage to you. Christ will be of no advantage to you. So how will believing that circumc- you must be circumcised to be saved, how will believing in the law cause Christ to be of no advantage to you? Take a moment and answer that question. If you're with somebody, talk about it. If you're by yourself, jot down your thoughts. How, wh- how is what Paul's saying here in verse 2 true? And this is, a, this is a recall. This reminds us of chapter 2, verse 21. If you flip back just a couple verses, chapter 2, verse 21. We're almost there. What does Paul say? I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for what? No purpose. For no purpose. Paul is saying the same thing here. Back in chapter 2, he said, look, if I, if I, if I believe that, that the law can bring me righteousness, then I nullify grace and Jesus died for no purpose. Here in chapter 3, verse 2, when he says, if you believe that circumcision can save you, then Christ is of no advantage to you. What he's saying is, you're saying you don't need Jesus. Christ, Christ doesn't matter. If you think there's things you can do to earn your salvation, then Christ doesn't matter. The cross didn't do a thing or didn't do enough. And you are, Christ is not your Savior. He, you are your Savior. Or the law is your Savior. So if you're going to believe this, then Christ is of no advantage to you. Christ means nothing to you. You can't find any joy, any comfort, any hope in Christ. You're choosing not to trust Christ, okay? Now we move to verse 3. I want to ask you, does that make sense? But I can't see you, so I don't know. So I just hope it does, okay? Verse 3. Uh, Paul says, I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision. So he's, he's kind of beginning this the same way he began verse 2. 
that he is obligated to keep the whole law. So Paul's making a second point here. He says, okay, if you're going to tell me that you have to be circumcised to be saved, I just want to tell you then you have to obey all of the laws. It, you can't just pick and choose. You can't just say, okay, I'm going to obey the, the circumcision law, and I'm going to obey this law about the Sabbath, and I'm going to obey these particular laws in, in Leviticus chapter 23 about festivals, but I'm not going to obey all the other laws. Let me give an example. One of the, the, I'm going to tell you one of the secrets about me that you may already know, but I have a tattoo. It's right here, actually. It's my wedding ring. So uh, I've tried to wear a lot of different kind of wedding rings, and for some reason they all irritate my skin. And so I decided to have my wife's name tattooed on my ring finger in her handwriting, right? It's the only tattoo I have. Uh, but I've gotten in debates with people over the years of my life uh, talking about whether or not it's okay to have tattoos. And, and most people say, you know, it's not okay to have, not most people, people who don't think tattoos are okay say that it's not okay to have a tattoo because in Leviticus it says not to mark your bodies, right? Uh, and, and my response to that is always the same. Uh, number one, you got to read the whole text. So that passage in Leviticus says, don't mark your bodies with symbols that honor false gods, okay? Uh, so, and, he, and, and that's written to a very specific group of people who were actually marking their bodies with symbols to honor false pagan gods, okay? The second thing is, that's not the only law that's in that part of Levit Leviticus. There's other laws there, too. And so if you're going to say that that passage in Leviticus means you can't have tattoos now, that's fine. I don't have any judgment for you. In fact, I respect you because you're trying to honor God. But if you're going to do it, then you need to do it all. And that very same chapter also says that you can't have any kind of, of clothing, wear any clothing that is two different kinds of fabric sewn together. So that means you can't wear underwear because underwear has elastic and fab two different kinds of fabric sewn together, Right? So, so you need to apply the whole law. And that's Paul's point here too. If you're going to say you have to be circumcised to be saved, then you have to follow everything. And we've already established in this class through the last several weeks that part of the purpose of the law is to show you that you can't do everything. That you can't be perfect on your own. Verse 4. Look at what he says in verse 4. He's continuing to these, talking to these people who accept circumcision. Okay, kind of t in your mind, I want you to compare that with the phrase of accepting Christ. Instead of accepting Christ, they're accepting circumcision. Or, instead of accepting Christ only, they're trying to say, I have to accept Christ and circumcision. Okay, so Paul's still addressing them in verse 4. He says, you, listen to this, are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. Next question. Why does accepting circumcision... Oh, wait. I missed that. That was the last question for the last one. Next question. What does verse 4 mean? I'm going to read it again, and then, then I want you to just pause the video, and I want you to think about this. Verse 4. You, those of you who have accepted circumcision, are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. I want you to take a few moments and consider that. So, you've fallen away from grace. Now, now, what does this verse mean? Here's the interesting thing to me. A lot of times in Christianity, we talk about how, about how when you sin too much, you fall away from grace. In fact, that very same phrase, fall away, is used, I think, in Hebrews 6, 6, one of the, those verses that t scare a lot of Christians and th make us think that we could sin so many times that we lose our salvation. So a lot of times, usually what we say when we say that, when we say fall away from grace, means you've backslidden and you're committing a lot of sins. But here it's almost the opposite. Paul is saying that, that you who believe you can justify yourself by not sinning have fallen away from grace. You who believe that you could justify yourself by obeying all the laws and being perfect have fallen away from grace. You have severed yourself from Christ. Paul's not trying to say you have lost your salvation. What Paul is trying to say is you're choosing not to depend on Jesus for your salvation and choosing to depend on your behavior for your salvation, on the law for your salvation. You're severing yourself from Christ and you're falling away from grace, not because of sins you've committed, but because uh, you are trying to depend on yourself rather than, than Christ. Now, I also want you to notice a word that's, that's used here because we're going to compare it with verse 5. Notice it says, you who would be justified by the law. You who would be justified by the law. All right? 
You think the law can justify you. That's who he's talking to in that verse. Now let's look at verse 5. I want to make sure I'm not missing any slides here. Yeah, con we're going to contrast verse 4 and verse 5. There we are. Verse 4 and verse 5. So verse 5 says this. For through the, what? Spirit, by what? Faith. So now he's contrasting. You believe that you can be justified through the law. Verse 5. But through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves, he's com contrasting here, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Now, that word righteousness and the word justi justified or justification both come from the same word. They both come from the same Greek word. They almost mean the same exact thing. All right? They, they, the root word actually means innocence. Okay? Or, or rightness, to be right, okay? And, and so, so in the one verse he says, you think you can be justified by the law, you're severed from Christ. We, on the, on the, on the other hand, believe that through the Spirit, by faith, w that's how we hope for the righteousness to come, all right? We rely not on the law, but on the Spirit and on faith. So I have a question. How can the Spirit help you with hoping for righteousness? How can the Spirit help you with hoping for righteousness? Take a moment and consider that question. The way that I would respond to that question is this. The Holy Spirit comes and lives in you and can assure your heart that of the hope to come. Can affirm for you in your heart, uh, uh, help you believe the things that you've read and what Jesus has said. Remember, the Holy, one of the things the Holy Spirit does is reminds us of what we study in His Word. The Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible, right? And so when we study God's Word and we find verses like Romans chapter 8, verse 1 that says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit's going to remind us of that. The Holy Spirit's also going to strengthen our ability to have faith, right? Math, Jesus says in some place in Matthew, He says that the people who are saved are the ones who are going to be steadfast to the end. What Jesus means by that is not the ones who are perfect to the end or the ones who don't make any mistakes. When Jesus says the people who, who remain steadfast to the end will be saved, what he means is the people who never stop having faith in Jesus, who never let go of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is there to help you keep the faith. And so the Holy Spirit helps, you, uh, remind, helps keep you reminded that... Um, uh, that your only way to salvation is Christ and that you have that in Christ. And in a minute, Paul's going to say the message otherwise that you could be justified by the law or by circumcision is not from Jesus. It's not from the Holy Spirit, okay? Got another question for you. How can faith help you with righteousness? Okay, so, so Paul says, through the Spirit, by faith, is how we have our hope for righteousness. Well, how can faith help you with righteousness. It's very simple, it's, it, uh, and uh, if, if you want to pause and consider that for a minute, discuss it for a minute, you can. But the simple answer is, faith is choosing to believe that Jesus is your only salvation. I'm choosing to trust that Jesus ha can and has and will save me. I'm choosing to trust that Jesus is my righteousness. That verse that we've quoted almost every single night of the study, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made Jesus who had never sinned into sin so that in Jesus you and I might become the what? The righteousness of God. I'm, when I have faith, I'm choosing to believe that Jesus can do that, that he has done that. Okay? Now, we move on to verse 6. Verse 6. For in Christ Jesus... Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. You know how mad that's going to make the Judaizers? Paul says, look, for, as far as Jesus is concerned, be, whether you're circumcised or not does not matter one bit to him. What matters to him? Look at what he says at the end of the verse. But only, here's the only thing that matters, faith working through love. Faith working through love. So, what does faith working through? How does faith working through love replace the law? Consider that question. Paul says it doesn't matter to Jesus if you're circumcised or not. Okay? What matters is faith working through love. So what is faith working through love? How does that take the place of the law? I want to direct your attention to another passage. Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 to 40. This is very familiar. Okay? Uh, a... a Pharisee comes to Jesus and says in, in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36, Teacher, 
who is the greatest, or I mean, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Okay, this is a guy who really loves the law. The law is what's going to save him. He's proud of the fact that he keeps all the laws. He brags about it, right? Which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus says to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your, I'm sorry, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And then verse 39, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love people. Verse 40, this is so key. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 40, Jesus says, On these two commandments, love God, love people, depend the law and the prophets. Everything else depends on these. Right? So when, when Paul says, the, it doesn't matter if you're circumcised or not. It doesn't matter if you obey all these Old Testament laws. What matters is faith working through love. What is he saying? You trust Jesus and you love God and you love people. All the other, you accomplish all the purpose of all the other laws if you focus on these on, on, on the love that you're supposed to have for other people. And so P- Paul's getting really passionate now. In verse 7, look at what he says. You were running well. Everything was going great. Who hindered you from, this is an interesting way to put it, who hindered you from obeying the truth? You were doing really well, and then you stopped obeying the truth. Who, who messed that up? Just a question for you to, to consider. What, how does one obey the truth? How does one Obey the truth. Okay, so it's really simple. When you discover what the truth is, then you apply it to your life. So a really easy example is, the other day I'm driving my new truck. I got a truck. It's not a new truck, but it's new to me. And I noticed that my gas tank was on less than a fourth of a tank. That was the truth. I was almost out of gas. So guess what I did? (laughs) I obeyed the truth, and I went and got my tank filled. I've come upon the truth that I cannot save myself, that I cannot save myself through works. My only hope for salvation is to throw myself at the feet of Jesus Christ and ask him to save me. I'm obeying the truth. Paul says, you were running so well, what's caused you to stop obeying the truth? Verse eight, this persuasion, listen, is not from him who who called you. This persuasion is not from him who called you. In other words, the notion that you have to be saved by being circumcised, the notion that you have to be saved by obeying laws, does not come from the one who called you. And who's the one who called you? Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is never going to point to anything else as a source of justification or righteousness or salvation than Jesus Christ. I got another question for you. How do you know what is from Christ and what is not? I really want you to take some time and prayerfully uh, consider that question. I'm not going to talk about my answers to that. I just want you to think about it. When you're examining your thoughts, your convictions, when you come across new teachings or ideas, how do you know what is from Christ and what is not? I would encourage you uh, to spend some time in James chapter 4 and 5. But consider that question. All right. Um, let's move on to the next verse, verse 9. Verse 9, he makes a quick point that's kind of prevalent throughout Scripture, particularly in the teachings of Jesus. A lump, a, a little leaven, leavens the whole lump. And so if you think that all, if you want to add circumcision to the requirements to be saved, like add that to Jesus, right? then it's going to infect your whole life and you're going to end up adding more and more and more. It's going to mess up everything. It kind of lends itself to old illustrations you may have heard, like, hey, I made you brownies and I just put a little bit of dog doo-doo in there, right? You're not going to have anything. No matter how little amount it is, you don't want to have anything to do with those brownies. Or or if there's one bad apple in the barrel, it's going to ruin the whole apple uh, barrel of apples. Christianity, salvation depends on Jesus, period. Period. Then we go on to verse 10. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view. And the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But I, brothers, still preach circumcision. Why am I still being persecuted? So there's apparently a rumor going around that Paul is still saying you need to be circumcised. So some of these Judaizers, instead of attacking Paul's credibility, some of them are just saying, oh yeah, Paul says you have to be circumcised too. And Paul says, if I was still preaching circumcision, then why am I being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. And so he says, I would be denying Christ if I was preaching that. So he's trying to dispel that rumor in verse 11. Verse 12, 
this is something really intense. He says, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. I'll just let you consider uh, what he means by that. And I would encourage you to spend some time asking yourself why Paul uh, would become so angry and so passionate to say something like that. What is it that's pushing him there? Verse 13, if you were, call, if you were called to freedom, brothers, for, I'm sorry, for you were called to freedom, brothers. This is a repeat of Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. For, for freedom's sake, you know, that Christ set you free. This is a repeat of, of John 8, uh, 36. Uh, if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. He's saying you were called to freedom. If you're a Christian, you're called to freedom. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. In other words, you're free. Don't use your freedom to satisfy your selfish desires. Use your freedom uh, to, sati- to serve others, to love others, to follow the greatest commandments upon which all the rest of the law hangs. That's what you should use your freedom for. And so that's, that's one of the big contentions people have, and we talked about this in the classes. If, if you know, you're saved by grace through faith and not by works, then why can't I just go ahead and sin so that grace may increase? And Paul talks a lot about this throughout his letters and why that's not okay. Here he just says, don't use your freedom to feed the desires of the flesh. You know, in Colossians, he puts it a different way. He says, set your eyes on things above where, where there are eternal things. Don't set your eyes on things here on earth where everything's temporary. Jesus says, store for yourselves treasures in heaven, right? Where moth and rust and thie- can't destroy, thieves can't break in and steal. Don't store for yourselves treasures on earth where everything's temporary, it can be destroyed, it can be taken from you. So uh, then we move uh, to verses 14 to 15. Uh, he says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. So now he's going to be basically confirming what we read from Jesus in Matthew 22 earlier. For the whole law is confirmed in one word, or in, in other, another way to say it is in one phrase, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? Paul says this is, how you, this is the law you need to be concerned with. Not being circumcised, not all these other ritualistic things, nothing else in the Mosaic law. What you need to be focused on is loving your neighbor as yourself. Verse 15, if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. In other words, one characteristic of, of thinking that, of, of, of applying all these other laws is it leads to division. It leads to destruction. More on that here in a, in a few moments. Um, I, I do want to make one comment here. So, so uh, verses 14 to 15, this whole idea that we are to love one another. We're going through this unprecedented time in our country, you know, all of 2020, all the way up to here. Uh, and there's, there's been so much argument over how we handle the pandemic, right? And whatever decision you make is the wrong decision. You know, uh, I've received uh, uh, peop- information or, or messages from people who are upset that we require masks, that we don't have people wear masks enough, that we, people were really upset when we w- went virtual, uh, particularly the second time, but we also had people who were really upset when we were open and when we reopened, right? People were upset. They didn't agree. And you know what? That's fine. Maybe you don't agree with wearing masks. Maybe you do and don't think we were doing enough. Maybe you think we, we should be virtual more or less or whatever. You know, that's your opinion. At the end of this, though, God's concern for the church is not going to be they went virtual too much, or they wore masks too much, or didn't wear masks enough, or they opened up too soon. That's not going to be his primary concern. I believe God's primary concern is going to be, did they remain united in the name of Jesus? Was their devotion to Jesus enough to keep them together? See, this is what Paul is meaning in verses 14 and 15 when he says, you know, the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love one another. Yes, we disagree, but you know what? We still love each other. Our love is founded on, on the gospel, not on the circumstances of this world, right? Can we remain committed to each other in spite of these things? Let's look at verse 16 and 17. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things, listen, that you want to do. Okay, uh, the, the flesh is actually going to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. Here Paul is pointing out a transition that we mentioned earlier. Remember Jeremiah chapter 31? The law is going to be written on our hearts. Remember that quote we read from 
from Rose's Moody uh, commentary uh, that, that the law is no longer an external thing, but it's an internal power. It, it's not something that we are forced to do out of fear, but something we desire to do out of love. So Paul's saying, but the flesh, so, so when you become a Christian, these things get transposed, and now I want to do the thing I really want to do in my spirit is what God wants me to do, right? That's the desire, and the desire makes all the difference. What I want to do and what I don't want to do makes all the difference. So I want you to look at Romans chapter 7, verses 15 to 20. Romans chapter 7, verses 15 to 20. I want to encourage you to read along with with me on this in whatever translation you have. If you need to pause it so you can look it up, go ahead. It goes like this. Paul is talking about himself. He says, for I do not understand my own actions. I do not, he goes, for I do not do what I want but I do the very thing I hate. Have you ever done that? Verse 16, Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. If I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So, if I commit a sin, but it's not the thing that I wanted to do, I'm still agreeing with the law that it is good. Verse 17, So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin who dwells Within me, verse, verse 18, I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. So he's not talking about his soul. He's talking about his flesh. Obviously, the Holy Spirit is with him in his soul. My flesh has fleshly desires. For I have the desire to do what is right. I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. This is the Apostle Paul talking. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Have you ever felt that way? Here's the key, verse 20. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Paul is not trying to to let us off the hook for sinning. But what he is saying is, the desire makes the difference. So if I am if I if I stumble in, in a sin, but but I'm battling against a sin and I don't want to do it, that's different than all I live for is that sin and I fully embrace it and there's no shame and there's no desire to battle it. Right? It's the desire that makes all of the difference. And so Paul says here in Galatians that, listen, the way of the flesh, now that the Holy Spirit dwells in you, the way of the flesh is going to try to keep you from doing the things you really truly want to do in your heart of hearts because the Holy Spirit's there giving you that desire. That the desires of the flesh are no longer your desires. They're the, the desires of sin, right? That's within you. And, and, and so we can't take every time we fall as a sign that we're not really saved, okay? We have to take it, hey, I know that's not what I wanted, and I'm frustrated with it, and I hate it, right? And that's what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 7, and that's what Paul's talking about here in Galatians. And so, uh, so it kind of adds to this whole discussion about the law and what it means. Let's look at verses 18 to 21. Okay, he's going to give us a long list of sins, and I have one very important question about this uh, long list of sins. Uh, it goes like this, verse 18 Uh, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Right? The Spirit's guiding you, not the law. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident. Here they are. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Okay, so he talks about drunkenness, he talks about orgies, he talks about sorcery, he talks about sexual immorality, and in the midst of that list, what does he throw in there? Divisions. And things like these divisions is is just as bad to Paul as orgies and sorcery, okay? So here's my next question. Why or how, that word who should be how, why or how are divisions, like other sins, listed in verse 18 to 20? Why or how are divisions just like these other sins? Why does that belong on the same list? Divisions amongst Christians. I want you to take some time and really think about that. I'm not going to answer that question. I just think it's an important question, an important thing that we should notice. Let's look at verse 22. Actually, I'm going to finish verse 21 and go into 22. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things, that list that we just mentioned, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, 
faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Now, when we look at the fruit of the Spirit, many of you guys are going to be very familiar with that. Uh, a lot of times, especially those of us who are still struggling with being legalists, we see that as evidence that we're not saved. Well, I'm not a very patient person, so obviously the Holy Spirit doesn't dwell in me. And we're starting to think just like the Judaizers were thinking, right? That my salvation depends on my behavior, this sort of thing. So I just want to give you three quick things of how to look at the fruit of the Spirit. Number one, uh, look at them as opportunities, okay? Uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. When you read this, say, man, if I'm walking with the Spirit, if I'm growing in Christ, one of the phrases we use, use a lot in this class is if I'm working out my salvation, then I am going to have the opportunity to have joy no matter what, to have peace no matter what. It's not something you're going to have overnight. It's something that you have the opportunity to grow into over time. The second thing I would say is look at them as, uh, as uh, discipline. So I have to strive for these things. I need to, I need to choose to love. I need to choose to embrace joy. I need to choose to look for the truth in my situation that will bring me peace. For example, preaching the gospel to myself, right? I have to choose these things, and I have to work on these things. So they're not just instant, oh, I got the Holy Spirit, now I have all these things. I have to work on them. After, after seeing them as opportunities and after seeing them as, as things to work on, then see them as the result of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you are choosing to work with the Holy Spirit in those areas, eventually those things are going to become more and more prevalent in your life. But don't see the absence of them as evidence that you're not saved. Otherwise, you're, you're guilty of, of falling into that category of severing yourself from Christ and depending on something else for your salvation. All right, let's look at verse 24. We're almost there, guys. Verse 24, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If you belong to Jesus, you've crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Here's the question. If I've crucified my flesh, then why do I still have sinful desires? Paul says uh, in Romans uh, chapter 6, should I go on sinning so that grace may abound? By no means. Those of us who were baptized have died to sin. So the question is, if I've died to sin, or if I've put my flesh to death, then why do I still have these bad desires? Does that mean I'm not saved? So my answer to that is, and you, I want you to, again, pause it and talk about it, but my answer to that is uh, this. The idea of putting the flesh to death, putting the passionate desires to death, doesn't mean you won't struggle with those desires anymore. That Paul has already said earlier here in Galatians and in Romans chapter 7, you're still going to have your fleshly desires, but those are no longer your desires. Those are no longer the things that rule your life. When you put them to death, you're not saying they won't be there. You're saying that they don't rule your life anymore. It's no longer I who live. It's no longer the flesh who lives, but Christ who lives in me, okay? And, and so when we talk about putting our desires to death, it doesn't mean that we won't have to struggle with them anymore. It means that we don't, they are not our guide anymore. Jesus is our guide. And it means that when those desires do come, we are going to attempt to kill them by the power of the Holy Spirit, to drive them off and battle them, right? And we shouldn't expect all the time for our, our sinful desires to become less. A lot of times they become more magnified because the devil's hitting us harder, right? Because we're getting closer to Christ. All right, verse 25, 26, and we'll be done. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become, what's that word? Conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So he, he creates another contrast in these two verses. If we walk by the Spirit and we keep in step with the Spirit, we, it'll help us not become conceited. On the other hand, if we're walking by the law, if we're following the law, what happens? What were the Pharisees like? They lived by the law. Were they conceited? Were they arrogant and prideful, right? This cut takes us back to Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9. We quote it all the time. I think I've quoted it three times today. You are, not sa you are saved by grace, through faith, not by works. What does it say? Lest any man should what? Boast. If you could save yourself, then you would boast about it. You would brag about it, right? And so here, Paul is saying, when we choose to keep in step with the Spirit, it's going to help us not be conceited like the Judaizers or the Pharisees who think they're above other people. They think that they're above, uh, above uh, lesser Christians. My last question, how does keeping in step with the Spirit keep one from becoming conceited? Consider that question. My response to that question is this. Uh, when we're keeping in step with the Spirit, we're allowing the Spirit to guide us. The Spirit knows what's best. Everything depends on the Spirit. 
How do we keep in step with the Spirit? We get into His Word, right? We study His Word. We allow His Word and try to apply His Word. That requires humility. That requires submission. If I am obeying the law, and I think that if I can obey all these laws, that makes me righteous, then I am actually depending on my own ability. My, 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 uh, my salvation rises and falls with how, how effective I have been in being obedient. But in the other sense, keeping in step with the Spirit is just following the Spirit's lead, going where He says to go, saying what He says to say, uh, and that helps us remain humble. So that's Galatians chapter 5. Uh, uh, in a nutshell. <laughs> uh, so thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, next week, we got Galatians chapter 6. Uh, keep an eye on your email. Look for an email from me or from Dion or from Lori uh, to see how everything's going to go on Thursday, um, uh, next Thursday. Uh, but, uh, but we will finish. Uh, we got one more session on Galatians chapter 6. If you have any questions about our study this evening, Galatians chapter 5, don't hesitate to shoot me an email. I will get to your questions as soon as I as I can, uh, because I, this is what I love, this sort of discussion. So let's pray, and we'll be done. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Galatians chapter 5. Thank you for the teaching you've given us here. God, I pray that we would apply it to our own lives, and that, that you would help us to uh, dive deeper into it so that we can express these truths to other Christians in our lives. We'll forever pray in Jesus' name, and all God's people say, amen.